Keith Wood, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, Chair. I'm excellent, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. Um, so the news came through that uh, Johnny Sexton has had surgery on his injured cheekbone and they haven't announced yet what they think the prognosis is going to be in terms of his recovery. But it's anything from a few weeks to a little bit longer. Um, what do you do if you're the Ireland selectors? Do you take this opportunity to say, OK, um, we don't rush back. Let's see what life is like without you and uh, remind everybody about why we need you so much. Well, I think for every player and for every coach, they would be looking to get their players back as quickly as they can, safely. So I think that's the only overriding um, call. I do think they get an, a chance and an opportunity to see which other guys stand up in that period of time. So um, uh, I don't know that they take it as being that they just leave it and say, look, take the Six Nations off and you'll be you'll be fine and we can see how we react. Ireland have always been very pragmatic in how they deal with um, with competitions in, I would say, in fairly stark contrast to uh, Eddie Jones over the last few years. Ireland concentrates on the here and now with an idea that they know that that's what funds the game. And if you don't do that, you can put yourself in a slightly precarious position. So... Um, Ireland want to do well in World Cups and we hope that they will um, break their duck and at this time and get past the, the quarterfinals at least um, though they're in the hard side of the pool but they they do manage their, their resources properly So I, I, and I don't think that Farrell is I, think, I don't think he takes chances I think he understands his players and he, he um I think he tends to get the best out of them. So, um, look, I would see it from him as saying, well, this is for life post Johnny. We have a great idea of who we have. But I wrote down the names of the out halves that we have. And I don't know that we've ever had as many players that you can say could play international rugby. Now, that doesn't mean that they're Johnny Sexton, but there's a lot more in the depth chart than there has been for a long, long time. Um, like there's a good chance that he's back early enough in the Six Nations schedule and that you know maybe it might be one game it, the, there's definitely there was a, an immediate catastrophizing okay he's gone for the whole tournament um, and then it's like well actually you know what would it be like to have Carberry play and be the man all week knowing you're going to have to be the boss against Wales you're going to have to go up against that back row and boss them around and move them around and move the ball down the pitch um, and also unleash our backline. Uh, so it, it's a it's a, a tricky enough scenario to manage, right? Because if Sexton's coming back for the second game or the third game, then you know you're really only keeping the jersey warm. Yeah, but I think it, things can change pretty radically if you get a good chance and play very well. And then it can be the situation after a couple of weeks that you're still playing and Johnny's on the bench because that's where the future lies, and also that's where possible injury could leave us in the World Cup. And that could be the right discussion to be having had at that stage. I mean, I when I look, I, it's funny, I was thinking about this uh, uh, yesterday when we were looking at the um, the different players at 10. Carberry's played well for Ireland at 10. Um, every time he's been called on, he, play, he probably plays better for Ireland than he does for Munster. I think he fits into the system a bit easier than he does, than, uh, than with the monster set up and with better players around him, which he has in Ireland. So um, I don't have any fear in terms of Carberry, in terms of that at all. I have been intrigued by watching some of the other players um, be put under pressure and shine under that pressure. Uh, some of the hype around Jack Crowley has been, it's premature. I think he's played pretty well. But um, having him as the second coming of Christ seems to be a little bit uh, aggressive. I think he's getting into the idea of uh, of managing big pressure games. I still don't think he is. I, I don't think he's there yet as a ten. But I actually think Roundtree's done an incredibly good job with him by putting him into twelve because he gets to play and be a little bit more robust and get stuck in a little bit. Um, understand the pressure that these games are and the pace of these games, which are radically different from anything else he would have played before. So I think he's he's getting there. Then you get Ben Healy, who hasn't been... He played his best game for Munster against South Africa and then wasn't picked again afterwards. Then he comes on and plays at the weekend. And what struck me with him was that he was taking the ball to the line 
that he was his passing was phenomenal and like really phenomenal. And of course, we know he can he's um, a boot that can kick the ball anywhere. So um, I just I just think it's interesting watching how they do it. And then I just to touch on one more Ross Byrne, who is often neglected by us on this show. Um, he then plays every game that he has to play this year and seems to have matured a lot more and is playing in a system that is protecting Johnny Sexton uh, in Leinster and uh, he plays in the same system. He is not to Johnny's standard, but he has played an awful lot better this season, I think, in general play. His, his goal kicking is the best in the country. What's what's your order of preference, Keith? If you're if you're Andy Farrell talking about your your ten depth chart after Johnny, what's your what's your what what order is your list in? Yeah, it's it's hard because it, like without going onto some level of partisan grounds, um, I think if you look at what Farrell has looked at over the autumn, um, his natural view on it, he was really interested in Kieran Frawley, but Frawley has hasn't played so. So that kind of knocks him back a little bit. Um, I think he sees Joey as his number two. I think he sees, um, as it stands at the moment, Crowley as his number three. Um, I think he sees Ross Byrne as his number four. Now, that's only because of some of the injuries that are there. Um, I'd still like to see Ben Healy get a, get a chance further up the line because there's a whole variety of reasons behind that, but we can discuss that in a minute. But that's where I see it. But I also know we have players that can play a style. So Crowley came on and played against Australia, but he played very deep because he hadn't been he hasn't played a huge amount of professional rugby. And that pressure is phenomenal. And that's not natural for him. And ultimately we want him to get closer to the gain line because that's where he's at his most cutting. And I think he is one of the players that can do that. But he can fit into an Irish system, I think, after a period of time but he would be very new in that system. So I think when you look at it at different times, those three players are the ones after Johnny. Like the, the Sexton injury obviously takes him out for at least the, that first game as it stands at the moment from the Six Nations perspective, but also from a Leinster perspective, it does give Ross Byrne the opportunity over the next month to play his best rugby of his life and stake that claim for the starting gig against Wales things would need to go spectacularly well for him and it's hard even if it goes spectacularly well because everyone would be like well sure it's Leinster what what would you expect so um, it, it, you know the other side of that is Carberry has to play better at 10 for Munster I, I know the point you're making about it's easier for him at Ireland with the better players and, and more go forward ball but he also needs to just say right this is my moment I've been waiting my entire career for this and the opportunity because you make a really good point if, if you play that Wales game and you, you play really, really well, then there's a decision to be made about getting Sexton game time and actually taking that opportunity to ease him back in whenever he's back. Yeah, I think that I, but I think that's valid once you get a chance. Like all sports people do, nobody wants injury, right? Nobody ever wants to see an injury in a competitor that you're, you're up against or a rival. But you know it's the nature of the game. If we look at it, there's 25% of rugby players are pretty much injured at any one time. So if you, I know that's a kind of loose st statistic, but for the purpose of this conversation, it's fine. So there's always a chance that somebody will be injured. And there's also always a chance for you to take your opportunity. And for me, that is the, the, the key component here. Um, in all the time we've talked about Johnny Sexton, nobody has stood up and taken that jersey. Nobody has grasped it. Now, that can come down to Johnny being a um, um, very powerful figure in Irish rugby, but it also comes down to the players not playing well enough. Now, they still don't have to play like Johnny. They can, they can play in the system that Ireland has set up and they can play a bit like Johnny, but they can have different things and bring different things to bear. Like let's like Johnny's thinking around the game is phenomenal. So he is plotting. It's like fast chess. He's plotting everything he needs as quickly as he can, but his body doesn't move as quickly as it used to. So a younger guy that comes in and plays well, plays consistently, pulls the strings that can be pulled, not at Johnny's level, but is then able to, you know, spot a gap because there is a gap and go through the gap and offload 
that might be something Johnny doesn't do anymore. So that's the change that you're looking to try and bring to it. And But you're looking for players to be confident. That's the point. It's They're going to get things wrong, but that's okay. That's There's nothing wrong in, in getting things wrong, but it's being confident in the decisions that they make. Um, and I feel that the, the out-halves that have come in have not shown that level of... Um, confidence to take over the jersey now and i don't expect it in some of the younger guys that's that's an inappropriate expectation as of yet because they need to get into it a little bit but for some of the older guys and ross Byrne in particular has never put a stamp on it um but I have the same token like I'll, I'll go back to the second you need someone to come off a bench to kick a goal i'd have ross Byrne, you know so um it's it's different it's an unusual situation as to what we have where do you stand? You mentioned Ben Healy a, a moment ago, Keith, and the Scotland links aren't going to go away anytime soon. And he is down the pecking order at Munster. So where do you stand on Healy at the moment? Yeah, I don't know where he is in the pecking order of Munster because um, we were, uh, you know, Munster were in Ulster on a incredibly difficult away fixture on a must-win game, um, totally blocked out of 40 minutes of rugby. Um they started to build a sense of resurgence for in that team when Healy came on. So that's something that's really interesting. And I have to say, he's he looks, I don't know him, met him once or twice, but I don't know him at all, but he looks very, very confident in his own capabilities. And sometimes that's required for your 10. You want your 10 to be a bit cocky or, or you know, know what he's able to go and do and then go and do it. Um I thought the team changed when he went on the field because, as I said, I think Crowley, I think Roundtree's done well with Crowley by playing him at 12 a lot of the time because he is he hasn't played a huge amount of rugby. So suddenly you had two, um, um, two playmakers. I could see Munster having three playmakers. I could see them playing with both of those at 10 and 12 and Carberry at 15 at one stage, which would be quite a departure from um from Munster's play of the last few years. But but I thought Healy's passing it, it there was a risk to it because he was passing in over the top. But the quality of the passing, you know, mitigated against the risk. And uh I thought he looked strong, sharp, um I thought Crowley upped his game in the period of time without that extra pressure playing at 10. Um and I thought they looked they looked like a fairly potent pairing to have in there and they got the win. I mean, that was the important element for it. It, was, it wasn't that pretty, but they eked out a win, something that was incredibly important for Munster to get to. Can I, let's talk, let's tease out the Scotland thing, right? If you're, if you're Cooney, I totally understand whatever you do at the moment doesn't seem to be good enough to get you in the Ireland selection. Whatever's happened, you're, you're at this stage of your career outside the tent and you're definitely uh, pissing in, right? But if you're Healy and you're cocky, flirting with Scotland, it, it, it's not wherever the, the whatever the thinking is, right? Unless it's just a pressure game with the IRFU to give them a proper contract and to to leverage your way to a starting job somewhere. Um, I, it doesn't speak to me of a player who's confident in their own ability to nail down the starting position at Munster and then subsequently Ireland. And I'm like, okay, well, if, that's, if you want to go and play for Scotland, go and play for Scotland. Yeah, I, I'm I'm intrigued with with all of that actually. And um, but here's the other thing: he's half Scottish and half Irish. That's one part, right? So you can look at it in that fashion. And um, so yes, he's living in Ireland, playing in Ireland. But that that is a way to look at it too. You, we automatically take him because there's any bit of Irish in him, we take him. You know, but that's that is part of it. Also, careers are short. You know, and you go and you play. Um, international rugby you have a higher value you have um, you have an opportunity to build your life out of out of elements of that and if you're like if there's a difference if the multiple is is huge of a difference that turns your head but it also turns your head if you're not getting picked so you could say one thing here and say well actually if I have a really good I'm confident but I see two or three different things in the way and they're not picking me at the moment, then it's outside my capability. Well, maybe I take something inside my capability. Now, look, I'm fighting against myself on that one, obviously, because I would think of him as Irish, and but he's half Irish, half Scottish. 
that's the, you know there's there's no way around that fact but um and I don't like players moving from one country to another I <clears throat> I understand the change in the law that they've had uh, in world rugby and I kind of agree with that a little bit for people who've moved from from some countries to other countries to go back but look I still think we need to get our head around the idea of what it is to play for your country so um he has an opportunity to do both but careers are short and I could just say that I'm becoming slightly more cynical as the world as as kind of as I get older but um the, the careers are tiny and the injury profile is very very high and if you're not getting a chance there's an opportunity elsewhere okay that, so I, that goes against that goes against the core of what I believe in playing for your country by yeah the way. I know I know I get that but you're saying you don't begrudge him if he ends up going to Scotland no not at all not even from, vaguely from no. an Ireland perspective then like from an Ireland perspective I don't think it's great from a monster perspective I think it's terrible so what um, what do you do I, what if you like do you think the IRFU should sign him to a long term contract then and say look there's a future for you here it might not be at monster yes I do, yes, I do actually no and I'm not even saying it I I think there's uh, I think there's a future for him in Munster and actually what he said is that he or well what I've read that he said but you, you don't always believe everything that comes in there but that he has he said that if he's playing in Ireland he wants to play in Munster um I like that as an attitude um and I think that we have been uh, Munster have been slow in promoting um, their own players. They've been fast in the last period of time trying to invest overseas. Uh, here is a guy with a fairly obvious talent, um, still a little bit raw, and um, but as he proved the other day, he is able to play well under pressure. So if we don't make too many of them, we can't be getting rid of them and letting them go elsewhere. And I'm sure there's financial pressures left, right and centre, but I think I think you want to keep the young guys in the game and you want to show that there's a path that if you play well, um, that there is a proper opportunity. I think it's a really difficult balancing act because of the economics, but that's the nature of it. I'd rather spend those economics on a young Irish guy than try and take... Um, a non-Irish qualified player in from overseas. Uh, Keith, Munster have turned their fortunes around somewhat, but a um, bit of a shit show up in Ulster. And we were kind of touching on the comments from, from Dan McFarland after the game in Belfast at the weekend yesterday, where, where he spoke about looking careless in attack, like we didn't care how precious the ball was. Um, fairly strong comments from McFarland, And it kind of got us thinking in terms of, I mean, they're hardly Jose Mourinho-esque in terms of pointing the, the, the finger of blame at players. But... Where do you stand on, on, on managers and post-match comments and what level of blame should be pointed towards the players? Well, I, look, it was, it was quite interesting. Um, we were in a frozen Thoman Park uh, and we discussed the hammering that Ulster had got um, uh, against Sale, I think it was, and um, the week after losing to Leinster. And I thought they were pretty... They were damaged by that loss against Leinster, against a 14-man Leinster. And then that damage led to the following week to total underperformance. And they've had a really, really difficult December and January. And uh, look, I think an awful lot of this, like I, I like a lot of that Ulster team. I like how they've gone about their, their play. I, I like how they've young players coming in. They've been on an upward trajectory all the time. There's been nothing really, Really bad in the last couple of years for them in terms of um, they've been beaten by other teams, but you can see the positives in their performance. This year they have they've suffered. That loss made them suffer, and I think they're having a, a huge amount of navel gazing at the moment. And I think that they are, I think they're a bit vulnerable at the moment. And so, reading the the riot act to them um, can be damaging or it can be transformative. And but it can only be done once. You know, if he starts coming out and saying that every week, I think it becomes a very slippy road for players and coach alike. Then at that stage, but there's nothing wrong. You you have to pick and choose your times to make those big comments. Um, but I would say that Ulster were dead on their feet um, at the end of that game. That Munster actually looked sharper as the game went on. They put in a huge effort to stop Munster play in the first half. 
and um, and they needed to be more accurate and they weren't accurate. And that's the nature of the game. They didn't take the chances that they should have taken and um, Munster took the two or three chances that they got in the whole game. And like Ulster were the better team for 80% of that game, but couldn't seem to find a place to score. So you can understand why Coach would be frustrated by that. And he gave them a proper public bollocking, really. Um, you can't do that every week. And he now needs to work in the background to help build up their confidence. And um, But I do think for this team, it's the first time they've had a very hefty hit of confidence over the last month. So it'll be interesting to see how they build their way out of that. All right. Keith, we've got to leave it there. Good stuff. Thanks a million. Brilliant. Cheers, gents. That's uh, Keith Wood giving us thoughts on the big rugby stories and that kind of growing sense that Ben Healy is gone from the Ireland situation. We'll see where that ends up.